Um, my name is Gordon Pedelford. I'm the incoming executive director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. <laughs> Glad to see my fan club is here tonight. Um, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways is a nonprofit that empowers neighbors to advocate for sidewalks, bike lanes, neighborhood greenways, crosswalks, and just safe streets for all people in general. Our moderator, Erica Barnett, is a feminist, an urbanist, and an obsessive observer of politics, transportation, and the quotidian inner workings of City Hall. She has been a writer and editor since the time of electric typewriters, a publication such as Publicola, Stranger, Seattle Weekly, Seattle Magazine, The Atlantic, The Austin Chronicle, and many more. You can find her work these days on The Sea is for Crank, where she's interviewed many of the people on stage tonight. And on The Sea is for Crank, you can also find her Patreon page to support her journalism, which is also flashing up on our screens if you're looking for that link. And, um, and while the co-hosting organizations um, all submitted questions to her, at the end of the day, the decision about what to ask is up to her, and so the questions we're going to hear tonight are known to no one but Erica, so please give a warm round of applause for Erica C. Barnett. Thank you so much for that, um, and um, thank you to all of you and to all the candidates for coming. Um, so yeah, I wrote all these questions, and uh, because it was my prerogative, um, I decided to do away with your opening statement. So you will not have any opening statements. You will have an opportunity to give a closing statement at the end if you want to address anything anybody else said, or if there's something you uh, didn't get to say, that would be your opportunity. Um, or you can give your standard closing statement, it's up to you. Um, the first question is going to be a two-minute response, um, and we will... The question is, Seattle is an auto-dominated city. What are three things you would do as mayor to change that trajectory, and how would you implement them? Hello there, I'm Carrie Moon. I have been working in advocacy for transit and urbanism for 15 years, together with a lot of you, so a lot of old friendly faces in this room. When we started the fight to replace the viaduct with not a highway, but heavy investment in street improvements and transit. We were way ahead of our time, and I think now the conversation is ripe and ready to happen. So three things I would talk about for how do we get away from car dependence. Number one, compact growth. I think we all know that the only way to have a transit system and a bike system that works for a majority of folks is to make sure we are planning transit and building compact development together hand in hand. Because affordability, quality of life, livability, and transit service and transit equity are really all the same challenge. Number two, space efficiency by mode. That's a wonky way of saying that our city used to prioritize level of service for cars, car convenience. That was always the priority in SDOT. And we have to shift, as we grow so quickly and grow so dense, we have to shift to metrics that measure how many people can we move. And guess what? Transit, walking, and biking are the most space efficient modes. We have to make sure we are prioritizing them and giving them the investments they need so that they work as modes of transit. Number three, equity. I think one of the things that we've realized in the past few decades of transit investment and transportation investment is the squeaky wheel, the wealthy white neighborhoods get the bulk of the money. And we absolutely have to shift that. We have to look at every single dollar we're spending and look at equity across race and class and make sure we are catching up and investing in transit for the communities that have been underserved for decades. Thanks. Jenny Durkin, and I think it's a great question, and I agree with most of what's been said. I think well, there's some things we need to do immediately and things that are longer term. I think immediately to get people out of cars, we need to make it safer for bikes and pedestrians, and we can do that immediately. We've done great strides on that, but we all know that there's still too many clashes between bike and car, bike and other transit, so we have to make it safe for people to bike. Second, we need sidewalks in all neighborhoods more medium term and, and immediately is, I think we should give bus passes to everyone under the eight, age of 18 for free. We got to start developing that culture of kids using transit from the youngest age and it's an investment that I think will pay itself off. So I would, I think Oracle Lift is good, but I think we need free transit passes for everyone under 18 
and we have to look even more at Orca Lift to make buses more accessible to everybody. Um, even with the Orca Lift discounts, it still can be prohibitive for people who don't make a living wage who have to travel great distances. So we need to bring that down to make it equitable. I think in the medium and long term is Sound Transit 3 is starting right now. We think of it as a long way off, but I spent yesterday doing a walking tour of Ballard and today out in West Seattle. We need to start having those outreaches with those communities because the thing that slows transit down the most is those siting issues and the fights around environmental impact. We need to start getting those sited now. That's how we're going to compress the time to make sure that we can bring those transits option quicker. And the third thing is we need to be planning what are those rich neighborhoods and communities that we want built around transit and have that transit density so they're destinations and neighborhoods in themselves and they have an array of all kinds of living from low income to medium to, to market rates as well as small businesses, restaurants, and their walkable communities. And I think if we plan now for that future, Seattle will be in the next generation the exact city we want it to be. Thank you. For the next question, we're going to start with Jessen, so we're going to go down the line that way. Um, and this is, you have one minute to answer this next question. Um, what does racial equity mean to you, and how does it impact your approach to land use and transportation planning? So in our city, I'd like us to have a citywide conversation around the impact, impacts of decades, if not centuries, of inequitable growth. Because we need to all get on the same page about what conditions we've created as a society that have created these terrible gaps in wealth equality, in access to transit, in, in home ownership. We created that system and we have to take responsibility for fixing it. So that's where the conversation starts. Getting all that information on the table and then building new dialogue around how do we correct these historic injustices, working together with communities of color so we have equal representation at the table to talk about what kind of future city we want to become. So who has a voice, who's listened to, who gets to help shape the future of our city is the first constructive thing to do. And then second, as been, has been said before, we need to look at every single investment in transportation through a racial equity lens and how do we correct these historic imbalances? How do we make sure we are investing and serving the least transit served and most transit dependent communities in our city? with much as would have been said and I think though the transportation equity begins even sooner than that. We will be spending billions of dollars to build Sound Transit 3 and other transportation packages. We need to get more minority contractors in on that so they have family wage jobs and those businesses so we can start re restoring you know equity um, at the beginning level. And then for transportation itself, we have to realize that right now the people that can afford it the least are being pushed out of the city, which makes their commutes longer and more expensive. We, we have to have more affordable housing, and it's tied directly to our need for equity in transportation. So I think we have to create more affordable housing so people can be living closer to their jobs. And for those people that don't have as much of an income, we have to give them more breaks on how much it costs for transit. So let them in on the pie and building it so they get part of the jobs themselves and create wage jobs. Second is make it easier for them to live in the city. And three is let them have part of the transportation because there is no equality. We need to do it through the lens of equity. Um, it's 30 seconds, so uh, get ready to speed talk. What will you do, and we're going to start with Nikita Alper, what will you do to speed up South Transit 3 delivery in Seattle? So, three things. First, let's look at getting through the design and planning process as quickly as possible. The siting issues, the planning issues, we have got to work together as a community to make sure we are leaving a lot of the slack time in there available for construction. So as fast as possible in planning and design. Second, look really hard at how we can contribute city funding to speed up delivery of the Seattle transit, the Seattle parts of the Sound Transit system. And third, work with Sound Transit to see if maybe we could use our bonding capacity or even a municipal bank to get better financing up front earlier. Number 
one, we can make sure and contact your legislature that there is no $2 billion hit to Sound Transit because they, they passed a law and so in that. Second is, we've got to get in those neighborhoods now. There's got to be planning, not just by Sound Transit, by the city, so we get rid of some of the red tape that's there. Um, we need good environmental review, but at the same time, if we start waiting in a linear fashion for planning, this will go like every other big project. It'll last forever. Um, the third thing we have to do is people in this room have to keep the pressure on. For those of you who don't have them already, under your chair uh, should be a whiteboard. Let's go ahead and get that out. We're going to have uh, some lightning round questions. All right, so on your whiteboard, um, and, and th these are no, no talking questions. I'm going to read your answers out loud so people can see, you can hear them. Um, you can't see from the back, or if your handwriting is terrible, I may let you read it, but that's it. Um, okay, uh, first question. Uh, please write down these four categories of, tra of the transportation system users in order of priority. Drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders. Right, Carrie Moon says pedestrians, transit, bikes, cars. Jenny Durkin says transit, cyclists, drivers, and peds. Uh, okay, next question. What percentage of commuters into downtown Seattle get there by transit and what, oh, you know what? I don't know the answer to this one, so can somebody look it up real quick for me? <laughs> um, what percentage of commuters into downtown Seattle get there by transit and what percentage get downtown in single occupancy vehicles? I know about the number. Here. Two questions. What percentage by transit and what percentage um, in single occupancy vehicles? The peak hour? Yes, peak hour. Commute. Karen Boone says about 60 uh, for transit and about 30 for, uh, for single occupancy vehicles. Bob Asagawa, 60, 35. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Durkin, 60, 40. 47% transit and 30% by car. So who got it closest to right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Mike McGinn was probably the closest. All right. Um, okay, next question. Would you keep Scott Kubley as SDOT director? And, uh, and if not, who would your SDOT director be? <coughs> Not sure, says, uh, says Jenny Darkin. Uh, Carrie Boone says no. We do a national search. All right, um, last question. This is just a yes or no. Um, do you support making Fifth Avenue transit only during rush hour? Um, Carrie Moon says she would do the fourth and fifth couplet. Um, Bob Hasekawa says, okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. And uh, Jenny Durkin says yes. All right. Um, we're running a little behind time, so this is going to be a one minute question. Um, and we'll start with Bob Hasekawa. Uh, what do you think about the direction the city has taken on mandatory housing affordability, also known as inclusionary zoning? Um, and do you think the uh, requirements in HALA are enough to prevent displacement of? Uh, people who are at risk of being pushed out by wealthier residents. I'd say the mandatory housing affordability requirements are a good first step. If we got the numbers about right, I think we could have done more in downtown and South Lake Union, but other neighborhoods seems about right. But there's a lot more in Hala that's good. We need to keep looking at multifamily and single family zones, which got shut, shut out, but I think we need to go back to that question because that's a huge part of the problem part of the solution. We need to look at a tax to stop the speculative development that is part of driving up demand and driving up prices so dramatically in our city. We've got to look at how to stop that and slow that. And then yes, invest a lot more in public and nonprofit affordable housing. We need to increase the housing trust fund at the state level. We need to look at that 0.25 uh, real estate excise tax that was in the hollow plan. There's other good stuff in the hollow plan that didn't get put forward, pushed forward, but we absolutely have to do that other stuff. 
because we're going to need all these tools if we want to keep up with growth and keep housing affordable to the folks who are not tech workers and even the folks who are tech workers are getting priced out of the city. So yes, all of it. I agree. I think the mandatory housing is a good first step. We absolutely we have a housing crisis now today for affordable housing both for low income and middle class. People are getting pushed out. People can't afford to, let, to rent, let alone buy. We need that partnership, so we create that. But that money in those houses aren't going to come online for a long time. Um, and we need solutions today. One of the things I think that we should have as a city is the right for those landlords, for example, who are providing good affordable housing, but they keep jacking the rents because their property taxes go up. I want to give those people a property tax break either freeze or lower the brakes if they agree to keep affordable housing on the premises. That could give us some immediate relief. I think we have to look in every neighborhood and every community to see if there's things that the city can do to invest immediately in housing, um, not in building new housing, but bringing housing market now and owning it as public ownership so that that housing is available today. I think that affordable housing is a good step, but again, it's too long from now in terms of when we're really going to get it and we need a relief immediately. Uh, next question, um, we're going to start with Carrie Moon, and this is a one-minute uh, response. Um, the city has adopted a goal of zero pedestrian fatalities or serious injuries by 2030, and yet in the past several years, pedestrian deaths and serious injuries have remained steady or increased. Um, as mayor, what would you do to provide safe places for people to walk in Seattle, and how will you prioritize which projects get funded? And you will get extra points for not just saying sidewalks. <laughs> So number one, funding. We have made this commitment to Vision Zero, but there is not enough funding put towards making it reality. So that's the first priority, is get it funded. Second, we have to look at reducing speeds everywhere, and we have to look at all the physical design issues around intersections and around streets. When cars feel like they're on a highway on-ramp, when they feel like they're on an arterial, they go fast, and that's how people die. So we have got to change the way we design streets so that people slow down and realize, oh, I'm sharing this space with other humans. I better be careful. And so sidewalk inter sidewalks, intersection design, street design, and, and slower speeds, and actually funding the Vision Zero priorities are the way to do this. And we've got to get away from level of service for cars, stop using that as our metric, and start using pedestrian safety and bikeability and transit access as metrics instead. I'm going to say everything she said, um, plus sidewalks. No. Uh, uh, and I think the other thing we have to do is, as we're planning these projects, remember that people are walking. Um, and there's too many times when we roll out our bus routes or we roll out, you know, the new cable car routes and we're not thinking about the bikes and pedestrians who are using those things too. So we have to bring that lens in every part of the planning we do. Um, we also need the funding. We'll use Bob's Bank. Um, and we, we, if it's a priority, it'll happen. And I think that the, the thing that we've seen is we give it a good name and people do incremental changes, but then other priorities take over. It has to be a consistent priority and that leadership comes from the mayor's office in conjunction with working with the council. So we need all the things that Carrie said and then I think we also have to every time we plan one of these new projects be thinking, how are the bikes going to get around? How are the pedestrians going to get around? If this is really the future we want where there's fewer cars, let's plan for it and do it now. Um, so um, now you have 30 seconds to answer the following question. Um, if elected, you will serve on the Sound Transit Board. Um, what are your top three priorities as a member of the regional body overseeing light rail construction? That's a great question. Um, it's in a really important position that the mayor has. Number one, you have to make sure you advocate that those positions do not become directly elected. There is a move by the rights wing that they want to kill Sound Transit, and so they want those elected, not appointed. Number two, you've got to work and use your bully pulpit to make sure that we really are doing all we can that we've discussed here tonight to try to speed up and condense the delivery of sound transit. And the third thing you have to do, I think, is as you're bringing it online, you're making sure that that transit is delivering the benefits you promised to neighborhoods and that development is happening at the same time. So when the trains arrive, the communities are there.
All right, we've already talked about speeding up the process and getting Seattle projects done faster and uh, getting the, the funding in place to build the whole system. Second would be equitable transit-oriented development, and I think two really important projects to look at are the Capitol Hill Light Rail Station, where the community was so involved in determining priorities and what they wanted built over their station, as well as the Liberty Bank Building, which is one of the few projects where the community is actually involved in making sure the new development builds wealth in the community. And then third, the Missing Mile Challenge, we've got to make sure transit, biking, walking to the stations works. And uh, we're going to have three lightning round questions. Um, number one, uh, do you support a, pro a progressive income tax in Seattle? Um, and if I recall correctly, I think you're all going to say yes. Uh, no, but the second part of that question is, um, what is one other thing you would do to shift Seattle toward a more equitable tax structure? And State Bank. Carrie Moon says yes, and state capital gains tax. Uh, Justin, uh, Jenny Durkin says uh, yes, and lower B&O tax. All right, next lightning round question. Um, City Council uh, is about to take up reforms to the design review process uh, that are aimed at simplifying the process and reducing the amount of time and money it takes to build homes in Seattle. Do you support these proposed changes? Yeah. City Council is about to take up uh, ref uh, changes to the design review process that are aimed at simplifying the process and reducing the amount of time and money it takes to build homes in Seattle. Do you support these proposed changes? <laughs> Jenny Durkin says, not uh, yes, but not at the sacrifice of the environment. Carrie Moon says, yes, in theory. Um, and the last one uh, for this round is, do you support the sale of the Convention Place Station and the granting of public streets and alleys for expansion of the Washington State Convention Center? Uh, Bob Hasegawa says yes, if we get a fair return. Uh, Carrie Moon says yes, if the package is good. Uh, Jenny Durkin says yes, but with real public benefits. All right, uh, this is a one minute question um, and we'll start with Mike McGinn. Um, Amazon has plans to hire tens of thousands of employees in Seattle over the next few years and current housing plans will not absorb that growth without, without putting more pressure on housing prices. What will you do to add more housing in Seattle, particularly mi missing middle housing, um, like duplexes and backyard cottages in neighborhoods that are now exclusively single family. Yeah. So we talk about this question a lot in our city and there's one thing, a big thing that it misses. We always assume that people are going to move from outside to take these tech jobs. Why are we not building better pathways to these tech jobs for high school kids from Seattle, especially low income kids who do not have the pathway to go to a four-year college. Can we do anything in the community college system to help them prepare for jobs in tech so that they can have these good, well-paying jobs? Second, we need to really look at our land use code, our permitting process, the thresholds for environmental review. We've created a terrible problem in single-family land where people think they don't want any more growth because the growth they see is not the kind of housing they like. If we could make more flexible zoning that was performance-based, we could be looking at community land trusts, congregate housing, backyard cottages, row houses, duplexes. There's all these great models besides the four-pack over a garage court that people would be willing to accept if we could make our process work for them. And that's, we need to go there working with low, with the developers and low-income housing providers who know how to do that. I think that uh, Justin's exactly right. Every neighborhood is going to have to absorb more density, and there's no question about that. We need immediately, I think, for some residential neighborhoods to make permitting for mother-in-laws, adu and dadus easier tomorrow so that we create housing. And then we need to have those conversations about how we add additional density there. The second thing we need to do is where there's some really exciting projects going on right now where some of the investment funds locally owned are seeing that they can build workforce housing 
and know that their return is going to be lesser now, but in the long term it will return more. I think we need to have private partnerships with those people to really bring on board more workforce housing immediately in neighborhoods and provide what government incentives you can do. The third thing is, I think it is tied to, we don't want all those people coming from outside, and I agree with Carrie Moon on that. We need more apprenticeship programs. I talked earlier today about how we have some of the best companies in this area and the best labor unions. We need to partner with kids when they're you know, young and build those internships, those labor-ready jobs, so that there's good family wages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, this will be the last question before your one-minute closing statement, since it's the 30-second question. We'll start with you, Jason Farrell. Um, Seattle's 2014 uh, investments in bus service uh, through Proposition 1 uh, will expire in 2020 during your term in office, if you're elected. Um, this includes $2 million a year for the Youth Orca program and other programs that improve transit access for low-income riders. What do you think the city should do to extend or replace those funds? So I would renew the levy. I think it's essential because it goes towards underserved uh, communities and it goes towards the Orca Lift Program, the Youth Orca. We absolutely have to keep that funding in place. That said, longer picture, or bigger picture, longer term, we have to look at more progressive taxation statewide because we all know the only way we're going to be the city we want to be is if we have sufficient revenue to invest in kids, to invest in the next generation, to invest in equity. So long term, we have to look at a capital gains tax, a more progressive B&O tax, closing tax loopholes, everything I've talked about before, more progressive taxation is the long term answer. This levy has been essential to some of the mobility we've had, so I think we should probably extend it. But we need to make sure that we're directing funds in the right place, and I would look at making sure I would subsidize more ORCA lift passes and the like, so people who don't have access to transit will have more easily access to transit. The second thing we have to do is it's got to be a regional solution. One reason we passed and needed these service hours is because the regional approach failed. And, every, and the other levies were voted down, and so we had to fill the gap with Seattle. So as a member of the Sound Transit Board, the mayor has to work on those regional solutions to make sure that Seattle doesn't have to go it alone. These have got to be regional solutions, and that's what I'd work for. Thank you. And now you all have one minute for closing statements. And So it has been great to be here tonight with you all. When I started working in activism for urban planning and urban growth and urban development and transit-based transportation systems, we did not have this resource of all the brain power of people in this room and all the many organizations, Seattle Greenways, Bike Club, Transit, Transportation Choices, FutureWise, the amount of energy and intelligence in this room is what we need to get us to the city that we all know we can be. With our wealth, with our progressive values, with the brain power in this room, with our commitment to equitable urbanism, there's nothing we can't accomplish. And I would be honored to work with you as mayor to lead us all together towards a city that is committed to sustainability, to shared prosperity, that's inclusive, that's welcoming, and that is creative and innovative as we know Seattle can be. I would love your endorsements. Thanks. I don't think this election for mayor is just about who's going to be the mayor for the next four years. I think it is about what is our city going to be in the next generation. Seattle is at this incredible crossroads. We have seen you know, great economic growth and prosperity, but with it has become challenges that I think are really taxing our system. The homeless situation breaks our hearts. Affordability is a real crisis right now. People can't rent or live in the city. And we've seen wage gaps increasing. And so when we think about that city in the future, we know the solutions have to come from the urban areas. Donald Trump has made it clear that he does not share our values on climate, on affordability, on wage issues, on labor. We have to lead. And on each of those issues, I believe that the mayor is going to be the person that can help lead us to that generation for the next generation. When I, my kids are here 20 and 30 years from now, I want Seattle to be the same city that's loved, but it's the new city we all want. round of applause for all of our candidates.
we'll be back at uh, 7 o'clock uh, for our City Council Position 8. Uh, so we'll see you in a few minutes.